Call to order the study session for the City Council for the City of Wheat Ridge, Colorado for January 7th, 2019. We are about 15 minutes delayed because of a power outage that we had earlier, but we're glad to be here and welcome all. Uh, I'd like to start tonight with any uh, citizens' comments on any uh, items that we have on the agenda. Uh, there's no one signed up to speak, but if you're here and would like to speak now is the time. Please come forward. And I don't see anybody coming, so we'll move on to our first order. And I am pleased to, uh, to uh, welcome and, and introduce Sam Mamet. Sam is the uh, CML Executive Director and would like to uh, visit with us about CML and how they can uh, help our city. Sam? Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, I got a call about a half hour ago from your esteemed city manager, and the call was something like this. I'm in the dark. And I said, well, why does that distinguish you from any other city manager I know in the state? Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm honored to be here in Wheat Ridge tonight. This city is uh, very special to me as I am uh, waddling off into the sunset because I'll be retiring uh, from the Municipal League staff at the end of March. But um, when I started with the league in 1979, 40 years ago, our offices were just up the street here at 48th and Wadsworth, and one of the very first mayors I interacted with, who's honored up here on the wall, was uh, Hank Stites. And Hank had a great deal of influence on me. He was very close to my predecessor, Ken Boucher, and Hank and Ken and I would go out to lunch um, periodically, and hanging around Hank, um, you know, I really felt like Wow, I'm, you know, I'm with a real mayor here, somebody who really loves his community, uh, cares about it. And when we uh, decided uh, to move downtown uh, to Denver, Denver downtown, be close to the Capitol, um, I can tell you that uh, Mayor Stites was none too happy because he was very proud of the fact that the league was located here in Wheat Ridge. And um, I, I always, when I come here and talk to the council as I have over many years. I always like to honor um, Hank's memory and his uh, legacy because for me, when I was uh, wet behind the years, uh, I still am, but when I really was just starting, he was for me sort of a larger than life kind of guy. And um, I really enjoyed being with him. And I uh, was telling uh, your distinguished mayor tonight just uh, driving up here on 38th, how proud you need to be of this community and the progress that you've made in all of the efforts around urban renewal and redevelopment. Um, this community is a crown jewel. It is amazing uh, what you've accomplished. And I know at times it's been difficult. I know there's been substantial public investment in all of this but the fruits of your vision and your labor is obvious to, to me, and I want to salute Wheat Ridge and, and all of you. And uh, uh, it's great to be here, and um, I have had a long admiration for your esteemed city manager and, and great staff here, and of course, to see my, I, I, well, I can say old pal, Janelle, because we are longtime friends on a personal level. It's really a lot of fun to be here. The Colorado Municipal League represents 270 out of the 272 cities and towns in the state. And uh, I can honestly say over my time with the league, I've been every place at least a half a dozen different times. I know every speed trap. I've been in every sewer plant, every fire station, every coffee house, every county road imaginable in the state from Denver to Dove Creek and every place in between. And I think the thing that uh, gives me great pride as being part of this organization is have the ability to work with you and your colleagues across the state on how to be, continue to be great and effective leaders. That's what you all are, you're leaders. Uh, nobody in here is a follower. I've never met anyone yet who has uh, served an elected office and has run on a platform of, please don't vote for me, I'd like to lose. You're all here because you're winners and because you believe in this community and people in this community believe in you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. 
So whomever uh, is appointed tonight uh, to fill the council position, I wish you much success because this is a journey of, uh, of, of public service, which is the highest calling, in my humble opinion. Uh, and, uh, and so at the local level, what you do best and what we help you do best is solve problems. All of you and your staff working with your citizens are problem solvers. And that's what I enjoy the most and what I'll miss the most about uh, interactions with um, the men and women who serve municipal government. You're a family. A lot of you who are newer to this world uh, are probably discovering that you have a lot of second cousins twice removed because this is a family. This is a big family of um, elected leaders. We have about 1,800 men and women across the state who uh, serve in this capacity as an elected leader. And, uh, uh, and, and so uh, I salute you for what you do and the personal and professional sacrifices that you uh, make to be here for the greater good of this community. And I assure you, when you are done and you hit the wall and you say, I, I just, I can't do this anymore for whatever reasons, you will look back and see at least one thing. There'll be at least one thing that you had a hand in that's a positive impact on the community. Few may know about it, but you can take a great deal of pride in that. And I salute you for that. And, um, and so thank you for allowing me to be here. The League as an organization does three basic things. Um, uh, we train, we inform, and we lobby. We do a great deal of training through the year, through our workshops, our annual conference in June, webinars. I've had more than my share of uh, folks in the municipal world tell me, oh, I know who you are. I listened to you in my pajamas the other day. That's a little bit TMI for my taste. I don't need to know what somebody is wearing while they're listening to us on a particular issue. But the webinars are um, a way to reach out to a lot of communities in this state who can't come to Denver. They're small towns on constricted budgets. And uh, we do training all through the year. We do leadership training for mayors. We do, we work with the city managers uh, on, on workshops and training. Uh, uh, throughout the year, we partner with other groups uh, like the Department of Local Affairs and other professional associations. Uh, so training's important. Information, in this world of yours, information is power. And you are a, an effective leader when you are well informed on the issues. And we try to provide cutting edge information on the most important stuff that you need to know about. And our world is constantly changing. I look back over um, the years that I've been with the League. I'll cite one, uh, prescription drug abuse, opioids. We never talked about this four decades ago. And yet, it's a health epidemic in our state and it is across the country, rural areas as well as urban areas, struggling with this issue. And it impacts cities uh, because your citizens are affected. Uh, issues like that that we've had to deal with. The, uh, Zach and I were talking earlier and I've admired his leadership in the whole area of affordable housing. We've always talked about affordable housing, but to talk about this, the topic of homelessness um, is something that we didn't always talk about, and now we do very uh, actively in our municipal world. I do a podcast for the League called Making the Municipal Connection. I just taped one uh, on Friday with uh, my buddy John Parvinsky, who's the CEO of the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, and we talk in a very provocative sort of way about how cities and towns need to respond and acknowledge uh, this issue in their communities. What can they do? And I can go on and on and on with the uh, issues. But information is extremely important. And of course, we put out a lot of information through the uh, year. I've given you some material that may be of help uh, to you in that regard. And finally, and particularly now that the legislature is in session, we lobby. I don't, uh, but we have four people in our office who are registered as lobbyists. And, and do represent the interests of the League and cities and towns at the Capitol. I started this job 
six five three hundred pounds when and that's when I started to lobby at the Capitol now you can see what's happened to me um, and that's why I don't go over there but all for 27 years I spent all my waking hours at the Capitol um, I uh, you know knew everything that you needed to know about the building everything I knew where the poker games were I knew where the booze was I knew everything and it was a different time and a different place, but uh, one of the things that I strive for when I represented the league that we still strive for, uh, and I'm asked this by new governors, by new legislators, what do you want? And my answer has always been just one thing, a partnership. I want respect. I don't want to walk in the building and look like, uh, you know, legislators are from Mars and city leaders are from Venus. I want to be treated as a partner. We solve problems locally. We need a partnership. Now, in a partnership, we may have our disagreements, and that's appropriate, because when you're under the gold dome, you have to look at things in a broader perspective. What's important to the state as a whole? And I appreciate and respect that, but if we, we can be seen as partners uh, serving the good citizens of the state together to make this state continue to make it a great place to live, then we've done our job. And I appreciate the sentiment that the legislature has held pretty consistently over these many years that we should have a partnership with local government and uh, the governor uh, equally so. And we have an historic session uh, at a variety of levels, and you've been reading in the media why in some ways this incoming legislature that convened on Friday is historic. Well, it's historic from a municipal perspective. We have 14 members of the legislature now, including your former colleague, uh, who have prior municipal experience, and four others who are former county commissioners. That means we have 18 people in the legislature right now that have prior recent local government experience. And that is amazing. We haven't had that in all my years at the Capitol, and they're on both sides of the aisle because there's nothing partisan about what we do here in the world of municipal government. Uh, and they work well together. We're trying, through Kevin Bomber, our deputy director who runs our legislative program, try to form a little municipal caucus where they'll get together periodically. The two leaders of the legislature, um, the Speaker of the House, Representative Becker, she served on the Boulder Council, very active with us, KC. And in the Senate, uh, the president of the Senate is uh, somebody I've just admired for a long time and uh, watched him kind of grow up in the political world. Uh, Leroy Garcia, he started his political career as a young pup on the Pueblo City Council, and he and I are very close friends, and they're just going to be uh, a terrific team. What are some of the key issues the legislature will consider this session? Well, uh, there was a great story in the paper uh, yesterday about school finance, and that really is a subset of a broader issue, tax policy and TABOR. Uh, colleagues, <laughs> we have to do something about, tab about TABOR. We have, to, we have to address it head on. Um, it's creating issues in school finance. It's creating issues with the way in which residential property is assessed uh, in contrast to how commercial and business property is assessed. We have um, many other issues that co are complicated at the state level uh, and they have to be resolved and it's difficult stuff. It's complicated because it's in the Constitution and it'll be very complicated as a political matter. But I think that's uh, an important issue and um, Governor well, I can drop the elect because tomorrow he's going to be um, sworn into office. And uh, I don't know how well you know uh, our new governor, but uh, he's a fine guy, and I've gotten to know him over my travels to D.C. and interacting with him. But he's surrounding himself with some pretty smart people. One of them is Carrie Kennedy, who he appointed as uh, one of his senior staff advisors on public finance issues. Uh, now Carrie and I have had our differences over the years over some policy issues, but man, she is really sharp. And I can't think of anybody better to, have, if I'm governor, to have at my side 
to help me think through some of this stuff than uh, Carrie. She's going to be terrific. Um, so that's issue number one. Issue number two is infrastructure. Sam, what are they going to do about transportation funding? I don't know. I don't know. This is an issue that a number of groups work very hard on. Bud's involvement in the Metro Mayor's Caucus, where they were leaders on this uh, one proposal to raise the state sales tax for transportation and transit, which we supported, but it went down pretty overwhelmingly. And so did the other proposal that was uh, put forward by uh, my buddy John Caldera. We opposed it, uh, that um, uh, tried to address transportation funding, but in a different way, then that got defeated. So now as a political matter, what will the legislature do is a very difficult question. I have no idea. And I don't think they do yet either. Um, so we'll see where that goes. There is a proposal the legislature passed last session as a backup plan to go to the voters this November, and unless it's changed, it'll be on the ballot, to raise a little over a billion dollars, something like that, for statewide CDOT managed projects. I don't know what they're going to do about that. So that's a, a, another issue. Um, uh, in the oil and gas area, I know this isn't necessarily a specific issue in Wheat Ridge, but it is in a number of other jurisdictions, particularly up in the oil patch up north of Denver and in parts of the West Slope. And what is the extent that local government should be able to regulate vis-a-vis -vis the extent that the state should regulate? And it's a contentious issue. Um, and it's complicated somewhat legally, and um, it's going to be a topic of uh, some conversation uh, during this uh, session of the legislature, and we'll be in the, uh, we'll be in the middle of that one. Uh, finally, another area in which I'm involved is water, uh, and um, I think it's the most important issue facing the state as we have continued to face serious drought situations. We're already in a semi-arid state. We're uh, uh, a headwater state as part of the Colorado River Compact. And as Lake Mead gets drawn down further and further, that has an impact on every citizen in Colorado because we're the headwaters for a number of river basins that feed into that compact. And if there's a draw in the compact by the lower basin states, Nevada and um, uh, California, uh, in Arizona, we're going to uh, pay a price for that. The governor, Governor Hickenlooper, three years ago, um, issued a lengthy report to state's water plan in 2015, but it, uh, it, it, and it identifies a number of specific shortfalls in funding for water projects in the state and other aspects of water policy. I've been involved in a group of folks looking at what are we going to do to fund that water plan. And it's a pretty serious issue. And when it comes to water, it's not partisan. Where you sit is where you stand. And if you're on one side of the divide, you're going to view the issue in one manner. And if you're on the other side of the hill, you're going to view it differently. If you're out on the Eastern Plains and you're oriented towards the interests of agriculture and farming, your viewpoint is going to be informed differently. So it's a very difficult issue. Water is very complex, politically and legally in this state. And uh, we've been cussing and discussing water since 1876, and even well before that, when we were still a territory. And uh, if you ever want to read a really good book about Western water, uh, uh, read Wallace Stegner's Beyond the Hundredth Meridian. It's a, t it's a tedious book. Um, it's lengthy and detailed, but it's all about one of my own personal heroes, John Wesley Powell, who staked out the West uh, as the first uh, head of the U.S. Geologic Survey. And I can go on and on about uh, him and his thinking about water, but um, that book has informed my thinking about how we should look at water in the West, and I think it's going to be an important issue. So how are we going to fund all of these different issues? That will lead me to my fourth and final point, and then I look forward to your questions. Sports betting. This is going to be a major issue in our state capital and the other 
49 state capitals across this great land of ours, starting right now, because last fall, the United States Supreme Court said in a case involving uh, the great state of New Jersey, uh, that the ban that the Congress passed on the states prohibiting sports betting was unconstitutional. Uh, I'll spare you the legal uh, details of that, but what that uh, has done is now uh, unleashed a, um, lots of conversations around sports betting. The casinos will have a lot to say about that, I am certain, uh, and so will many others. How much money can sports betting generate in Colorado is an unknown, but I do think that one of the driving forces around funding some issues in this state will be around the topic of sports betting. Uh, and I'm sure that the Major League Baseball, the NFL, the NCAA will all have lobbyists at the Capitol, as they will in every state in the Union, and it's going to be a huge um, issue uh, at the uh, Capitol. Uh, and Zach, I also think affordable housing will be at the top of the list for a lot of people. Governor Polis has talked about it, and there the issue is going to be funding, as it always is uh, with these uh, significant issues. Um, and we'll have a lot of stuff we don't even know about yet. And yes, we pray at the altar three times a day uh, when the legislature's in session, the altar of home rule and local control. I bow down three, day, three times a day um, and, um, and, and pray at that altar, and uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll always get into these tussles on what's a matter of statewide concern and what's a matter of local and municipal concern. And sometimes, it's not always clear cut, and the art of compromise has to be a part of the conversation at times, and uh, we just have to see where all that uh, goes. I want to thank you for your leadership. It's an honor to be here, and I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, anybody may have about, uh, about stuff uh, going on at the uh, League. So thanks uh, very much for allowing me to be here, Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Mamet, for very nice uh, introductory remarks, and we'll open it up for questions from Council. Mr. Urban. Thank you. Not so much a question, but just wanted to <clears throat> say thank you to Sam for all your hard work at the Municipal League and across the state on a variety of, or almost all the issues that uh, we come across. So I appreciate all the work that you've done, and uh, 4800 Wadsworth, where your offices used to be, is where my office is. So. Uh, thank I have you a lot much. of memories of that building. It's still standing. I thought I was going to wreck it a couple of times, but um, <laughs> it's still there. And uh, we were up on the, I don't remember, we were on the second floor. I can't remember. But um, I got a lot of fond memories of that place and uh, just being here. So thanks. Uh, and I appreciate what you do in the housing arena. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Matthews. Thank you. Um, you had talked about uh, on the water issue, either you live on the east side of the divide or the west side of the divide. Um, I forget how many municipalities you said you represent here, but- 270. How do you guys split the baby when we have eastern plain cities, we have suburban cities, right. we have western cities, uh, large cities, small cities, how do you guys that's split a, the baby? That's a terrific question. You know, uh, public policy is nuanced. We deal in the world of the shades of gray, not always the colors of black and white. Uh, you do it at the local level, we have to do it at the state level. Uh, and, and so on an issue as daunting and as complicated as this one is, as an organization we have to stand back, and as a city oftentimes you have to stand back and say, okay, we need to play in this sandbox, but where are our priorities? Because we cannot get into everything. A, because we won't be able to solve it all. B, and even more importantly, we have a finite amount of political capital to spend. How can we spend it? So we have looked at the water issue in several different ways. Number one, funding, to make sure that there's always a reliable revenue stream at the state level that supports 
um, water infrastructure, uh, at, particularly at the local level. Uh, that's important, and some years it's been a struggle. Number two, particularly for smaller rural communities, um, they labor under significant regulations that in a larger city may be less problematic, but in a small town out on the Eastern Plains like Holyoke and Haxton and Hill Rose, I'm meeting with those guys later uh, next week, um, I hear a lot about health department regulations and EPA this and EPA that and uh, every regulation, however well intended, because none of us in the world of municipal government oppose water quality, but these regulations come at a cost. How can we help those smaller rural communities with uh, limited resources address that, and how do we articulate that to the powers uh, to be uh, at, um, at, uh, at these state agencies? Water conservation, and more specifically, the relationship of land use planning to water development. We never used to talk about this issue because it was a very tricky emotional issue. But you know, you've asked a great question because the last year or two we've sponsored some workshops and seminars in our office collaborating with some other groups about the relationship between land use planning and water and how you grow and develop in one community has some direct impacts on another jurisdiction. And we've been able to talk openly and honestly about that sort of thing. Where does it get more difficult? Well, uh, when proposals come up about water transfers and taxing a water transfer, imposing a tax on a water transfer that goes from one basin to another basin, uh, that gets a little trickier and a little more um, uh, difficult. But you know, in all of these complicated issues, and I say this to your counterparts across the state, look at those areas of an issue like a complicated one as water is, where can we make a difference and where we can have the ability to reach a consensus because we can't be in every, uh, every issue. And there are times where we have to step back and say, well, the best we can do is inform our membership and they'll have to decide on their own what is in their best interests. So that's how we tackle this kind of an issue um, and, uh, and, and take a look at it. Um, and it's when I have the most fun. I like working on messy, complicated, contentious issues. When I used to lobby, I relish going into a room, having the door locked with uh, my mortal enemy on the other side and being told you better cut a deal or else. I love doing that. I mean, I used to just love walking out of the Capitol. There were days I'd come home to my wife and she said, well, how are you doing? I said, you know what, I manage to piss off everybody today. And she used to say, well, you know what? You did a pretty damn good job. <laughs> and um, sometimes that's what a good compromise is. And that's how we look at um, a tough issue like water. We have got to tackle and discuss statewide the issue of water because of um, some of these challenges. So it's a, great, uh, it's a great question. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Additional uh, questions for Mr. Mamet. I keep talking, I'm going, to squ I'm going to scare away the people who want to uh, that's, sit up well, here, and I don't want to well, do that. that. That's part of the acid test, I assume. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Sam, have you, uh, have you got plans going forward? Well, yeah, um, we, uh, I, I appreciate that, uh, Bud. I want to stay connected with people, so uh, whatever that means, I want to stay involved with uh, local government, and I've been, some people have approached me. I don't have any... Um, I don't have any designs to work full time. I think the one thing I want to continue to do, uh, I mean, on a on a personal basis, I want to. My golf game is in serious need of attention, and uh, I can never ski enough. There aren't enough days in the week to get in skiing, and we have a place over in the West Slope that uh, we have a place over in Crested Butte that I like to hide uh, over there. Uh, and uh, but uh, but on a on a on a very personal level, and I know this sounds corny, but it's what I've been telling people, I want to be a good citizen. I want to get involved in stuff that continues to help make this state a really cool place to live in. I want to get involved in
groups and in nonprofits that help address important issues that are important to the entire state. Wherever that takes me, I don't know, but I want to I want to do that. Um, no, I don't want to run for office. That's that's not because I don't appreciate what you do, but. Um, I wouldn't vote for me, and I know my wife wouldn't, so there goes two votes right there. But um, I, I want to be a good citizen, um, whatever that means, and I want to stay in, involved. And, uh, and so those are some things that are on my, um, my uh, interest. And I want to see the Rockies go to the World Series. I mean, I've waited long enough. Coming soon. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. So thank you very much for... Allow, yes. I just wanted to um, tell council that um, the deputy city clerk, Robin Eaton, recently um, helped with a webinar for city clerks with liquor questions. And he was told that it's the largest it attended is that what you call attendance for a webinar? Thank you. I, I, I should have mentioned uh, Robin's involvement. It was off the charts. It was on liquor licensing. We, you know, we, we develop our legislative policy through a statewide committee called our policy committee, but it really meets to discuss legislation. And uh, over the years when we've lacked a lot of issues for the agenda, I've always said, look it, put something on dealing with liquor licensing, that's sure to kill two hours in the meeting because all of our folks, you all love to talk about it. It's one area that we guard very jealously as local officials and things have changed recently. We did a liquor license law update and Robin knocked it out of the park. We had, uh, I don't remember how many people were on it, but it was like a record. I couldn't believe the number of people, so thank you. I should have mentioned that and I forgot. So kudos to Wheat Ridge and give Robin um, a little shout out for that. Yeah, it was off the charts. It was very well done. He, very well done. <laughs> Thank you. Any other, uh, uh, Mr. Urban? This is inconsequential, but I'm curious, what are the two cities that are not part of Bonanza and who else? All right, you're gonna go with me. All right, we're gonna go visit uh, Sheridan Lake you have no idea where Sheridan Lake is. It's way out on the Southeast Plains. And you can walk to Oklahoma from there. And then we're gonna to go to Bonanza. Um, and um, uh, Crestone is a suburb of Bonanza. That's down in the valley, San Luis Valley. There's one legal resident in uh, Bonanza. <laughs> and by God, if I have to pay that town's $2.98 <laughs> worth of dues, I'm gonna get him to join the league. So those are the two Thank you. that are members. Thank you. Well, Sam Mamet, thank you very much for, for A, the work that you've done you. for, uh, for your organization and for our city over the years. It's a, right. it's a tremendous uh, benefit to our city to be part of your organization. Well, I, we feel the same way. I'm going to leave my extras here, and I think you want me to Terrific. We've got, you, uh, uh, if you would help me, we have our next, uh, next up on the agenda is City Council candidates for District 1, and before the meeting, I put the three candidates named names on a piece of paper in the box so that we would know the order that they were going to speak in and Sam has agreed to help me uh, help me draw these so okay very good I won't look here this will be uh, this will be okay the first speaker the first speaker uh, John Hickenlooper <laughs> <laughs> Ann Brinkman okay and and Ann will speak first Todd Helton. No, <laughs> uh, J uh, I want to make sure I pronounce this properly. Jahi. Jahai. J Jahai Sim Simbari, I believe. Simbari. Very good. Plus, All right. He will, uh, he will speak, I apologize. speak second. I apologize. And just so that we get everybody uh, an even pick. Okay. Mm -hmm. Down here, last but not least. Let's see here. Douglas Bruce. No, that <laughs> <laughs> We'll continue our discussions after. <laughs> David, David Keeter. David Keeter. Keeter. All right. Pardon me. Well, all right. Good luck to be all. number three. Sam. Hey, Bud. Great to Thank see you. Thank you very much. Hey, Appreciate thanks a lot, my friend. Thank you very Thank much. you all. Good luck to you all. Thanks. Thanks, hey, Patrick. Yeah, see you again. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, that that concludes our. Um, 
our first order of business. So uh, next on the agenda is the uh, City Candidate Council District 1 presentations. As you're uh, aware, one of our councillors was, um, was promoted by the, by the citizens to, to serve in the legislature and is, uh, has um, resigned from our, from our board. And uh, we um, have advertised that, that position over uh, about a 30-day period, if I, if I recall. Uh, and we have had three candidates uh, submit uh, applications for, for uh, that, uh, that seat on council. And uh, we are going to hear a presentation from each of them. Um, they've been, uh, they were notified by our uh, deputy city clerk that they would speak tonight. So, uh, and Mr. Mammon has drawn, drawn the numbers. So without further ado, Ann Brinkman is our first speaker. And if you'd like to come to the, to the podium, and uh, I hope Ooh, the, to the podium. Uh, uh, well, the podium good? Yeah, or wherever, wherever you'd like. Wherever you'd like, you may, you may seat or you may stand. All set. Okay. Hi everybody. Good. Um, thank you for seeing me. Um, I'm going to steal something that Sam just said, and I'm here because I want to be a good citizen. Um, I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Um, I'll give you about five minutes telling you about how I've supported Wheat Ridge in the last 25 years that I've been here, um, my career, um, what I see as the priorities um, of the city. So. Again, I'm a project manager, so everything is pretty cut and dried here. Um, I've been a member of the Planning Commission for several terms, including, I, I honestly can't tell you how many terms, I apologize, uh, including a vac filling in a vacancy for District 2. Um, during those terms, I believe I was chair twice. Um, I have been lucky to participate in some of the key planning and zoning cases, uh, Cabela's, before Clear Creek Crossing. Um, multiple 38th Avenue redesign plans, and some of you know my opinion on that. Um, updates to the comprehensive plan, two sets of updates to the comprehensive plan. Broad zoning updates, um, several, several sub-area plans, and the initial NRS, and more. I've been part of the DIRT committee twice, the inaugural and then the second round, to provide consistency and um, connectivity between the two. Um, from a volunteering standpoint, I've supported local works with the criteriums every year. So I'm, um, I stand there and make sure that um, they turn when they need to turn. <laughs> um, I've been uh, to the early trunk and treats. I was on at at uh, early on, and then wherever else I'm asked to help, I help. Um, my garden has been part of the Wheat Ridge Garden Tour twice, and then I volunteered for that as well. Um, I led the bike tour, and then I'm also a garden helper. And then I participated in the Civic Academy, which was an early on, we had a Civic Academy here. Um, the Police, Citizens Police Academy, and the Wheat Ridge Police Department Dog Walker Watch Program. So I was in the inaugural one for that. So professionally, I am a project manager, and um, I work for a public company down in Denver, Service Source. So I'm a services project manager where I support customers who want us to provide a variety of different services. Um, overall, I've been a project manager, a program manager, a team manager, a department manager um, for over 30 years. I've also led the integration of acquisitions by a former company, and I'm also chief bottle washer. So uh, anybody, if they wanted me to do something, I stepped in. Um, I was very successful, and I was lucky to have a variety of career points in my 30 years. So why am I here? Um, here are the things I believe are my qualifications. I have a broad understanding of development and zoning code, not at an engineering level but um, I understand the reasons and the benefits of zoning. And um, if I don't understand somebody, something, I ask. Um, I'm not too proud to ask. Um, I bring a project manager sensibility to the role. So I look at scope and time and cost and quality on everything, everything for, throughout my life actually. Um, I can be counted on to be fair and impartial to um, all things with regards to the citizens, to businesses, to city staff, and to council. And I think I've shown that, I hope I've shown that um, in, in my time in Wheat Ridge. 
Um, I enjoy meeting people. I like to listen to their, their ideas. I like meeting them in the grocery store. I have no problems with that. Um, and I like to listen to their ideas and concerns. Um, I enjoy the opportunity to learn and to support Weaverage. And then um, the last thing, and I, it's not so important now, but I have no allegiance to, or I don't owe anything to any political side or party within Weaverage. So I've been very careful about that throughout my life. So these are my three top priorities, smart growth, um, and that comes from my planning commission background, which means encouraging a mix of building types and uses, diverse housing and transportation options, development within existing neighborhoods, and community, community engagement. And as a city, we've been doing great things um, for a number of years on this. Um, I'm big on ensuring the city has uh, receives adequate funding, funding on their infrastructure. So I hate building something and then there's no maintenance for it. It drives me nuts. As a project manager, I want to make sure that it's standing or it continues to run or it continues in a good fashion. And the last thing is improving opportunities for tax revenue. And that, that, that goes broadly. I mean, things are changing. So nothing's off the table to me, so to speak, on this. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, I will open up to uh, council for a brief um, round of questionings if anyone has a question. Mr. Urban. Um, as it relates to uh, the upcoming uh, end of this term, do you have um, or, or can you say right now whether you would be running for re-election in, uh, in that race or? Uh... I can't. Okay. I honestly can't. Um, as I was just telling Janice, I said that's a number of months out. Um, I'm employed full time um, and have been, so that would continue. And I, I wouldn't have applied if I wasn't interested in looking at that, but I can't commit to it at this time. Okay. And then as far as uh, the time frame between now and November, mm -hmm. uh, do you commit to showing up Absolutely. and attending the meetings? Absolutely. So I had a great um, uh, attendance record on Planning Commission. I visited all the sites. I did all that as well as volunteer. I didn't even mention all the things I volunteer within um, within the community. So yes, I can commit to that. Um, I, I pretty much know the, the drill, so to speak. So yes. One more. Sure. Um, as it relates to uh, the different boards and, and whatnot that you've served on, is there a time that you can give us an example of where you had a differing opinion from whatever was being recommended by the organization or the staff? Absolutely. This shows how old I am. Um, the construction, which was wildly popular, down by, um, down on the east end of Wheat Ridge on 38th. Um, it's the row houses that front 38th. Um, thank you. Um, I voted no on that because I said that 14 foot wide houses didn't make sense. And I honestly didn't think they made it. It was the width of a Volkswagen bug. And I, and I voted no on that when everybody else voted yes. Clearly, I was wrong. Um, and clearly, that's, um, that's a trend. And that's fine. And I've learned from it. But that's a glaring recent example where I went against the, the grain, so to speak. Thank you very much. Ms. Hobby? Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Anne for um, for applying and coming and uh, giving us a piece of your background and your interests. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Matthews. Thank you. One of your priorities you mentioned there is smart growth. Yep. Um, that term gets bandied about quite a bit. There's actually some technical, if you will, descriptions based on whom you're talking to and what organizations for what it, uh, encompasses smart growth. We're a landlocked city. We've been approximately 30,000 people for years. What, how do you define growth in our city? Is it population-wise, revenue-wise? What's, what's your goal in accomplishing smart growth? So I don't have a goal, per se. What I would say that City Council is there to do is ensure that the neighborhoods are protected 
um, especially the inner neighborhoods along major arterials. Um, I could see that mixed use is uh, useful, especially on, um, on 38th, on 44th, or whatever. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily population. Um, I would say that you just have to look at it in the total of what it's bringing, what the project's bringing. If the property owner has the right to do what they're doing, or if it, it goes directly against whatever's zoned without a great deal of um, adjustment, um, but I, d I wouldn't have a goal per se. So I don't want to say I want to grow to 50,000 by the, I, that's ridiculous. So it's not a person growth, it's just smart growth. It's making sure that whatever infrastructure we have now sustains um, the people that come to Wee Ridge as well as live in Wee Ridge. Um, accessory dwelling units I know are a hot topic around here and people have been doing it for decades if not longer. Um, there's all kinds of opportunities to look at things, and I'm, I would be here along with the rest of the city council to listen to what staff is recommending as well as um, uh, consultants and citizens. Is that too maybe pam nope, for you? Nope, that's okay. fine. Um, <laughs> item three is improve opportunities for tax revenue. What, yep. what do you uh, envision as the upcoming opportunities for raising more taxes? Um, again, I think we are at a point of time where there are things that we hadn't thought of five years ago that are now in producing tax revenue. Um, I don't know. That's why I'm saying I, I, I've been reading. Um, there, it, it could be anything. It could, it, it runs the gamut, and that's why it's surprising to see what Reach has done and what it hasn't done and what it, it's taken advantage of. I don't know. I'm just saying I would look at that when I say smart growth. I would say what are the tax implications, what is it bringing in, and what are the impacts either to the citizens, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, additional questions? Mr. Urban. This may be somewhat unfair, but if, uh, if we can look to the next agenda item, uh, have you read that at all or looked at that at all? Remind me. Uh, the, I read uh, the front page, I think. The tracks multifamily project. I did not read it. Okay. Never sorry. Mind. Thank you. I'm sorry. No more questions. Cool. Thank you. And thank you very much. Thanks very much. Our next, um, our next presenter is uh, Jahai Simbai. And I hope you'll correct me if I didn't get the, but come forward and, and you may either use the podium or the, or the seat. Uh, I'll use the seat as well. Terrific. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jahi Simbai. Jahi means dignity in Swahili and Simbai means strength in Shona. Both are languages that are spoken in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, I was born on the Army base in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. My father is born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, and my mother is born and raised in Bridgeport, Connecticut. My wife, Alvina Vasquez, and I uh, live on 26 in Pierce, and we've been there for almost five years. I'm the Assistant Dean of Graduate Studies at Colorado School of Mines. I've been at School of Mines for 18 years. I have an undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Colorado Boulder and also an MBA. I've worked for a little bit at Ball Aerospace as a structural analyst. I did some tech support work up in Louisville and I've had three different positions at Colorado School of Mines. I think what I could bring to the council is a diverse set of skills and experiences. Um, one of the things I know David saw my TED talk I, I did at School of Mines. One of the things that I am super interested in is something I learned in graduate school and it's called the genius of and versus the tyranny of or. And it's the idea that there's two different items out there that seem disparate that you figure out how to get those two together. For example, in business, high quality 
and also low cost. So the city of Wheat Ridge has an opportunity for and. I read in the, um, the neighborhood revitalization strategy that part of Wheat Ridge was, one of the issues Wheat Ridge is looking at is that it was a destination for lower income families. And we wanted to try and find opportunities for higher income families. You have to be careful about the idea of or in that situation. We can have lower income families or higher income families. But the power is in the word and. We can have lower income families and higher income families, just as an example. And what I've done in my career is try to solve problems. I mean, as an engineer, that's what we do. Look at problems that are out there, try to figure out different ways to get to solutions. And that's what I hope to be able to bring to the council. It's a very exciting time for Wheat Ridge. I know that Wheat Ridge is turning 50. Um, and I know that the um, Historical Society is doing something this weekend, and so I'll be there with my wife to learn more about the history of Wheat Ridge. I don't know that if Wheat Ridge is turning 50, then the Carnation Festival is also turning 50. I know a lot of things are going on. Um, Wheat Ridge is well positioned to do things. And I lived for 13 years in Edgewater. I saw that change in a short period of time. What's the possible change for Wheat Ridge? My goal for the councils are three. Number one is to listen. Definitely want to listen to the council, listen to the residents of Wheat Ridge, and particularly District 1 and listen to council member Hoppy, who knows what she's doing. Second goal would be to learn. There's a lot going on in Wheat Ridge, and there's a lot that I don't know about public service, and I need to learn. Learn from the mayor, learn from the city manager, from the clerk, learn from you, and learn from the city, citizens in the city. And the third thing is to lead. It's, it's been my career to be a leader, and I would like to be a servant leader, this is a new opportunity for me. I saw that there was an opening. I put my hat in the ring. I wish I could tell you there was a grand scheme I had, but there wasn't. I'm in Wheat Ridge now. My wife and I plan to be here for the rest of our careers. And since there was an opening in our district, we put our hat in the ring. Um, so finally, in closing, I just want to make sure I give thanks to Monica Duran for her service to the council and to District 1 um, as she moves on to represent us in the state level, District 24. And she's left some significant shoes to fill. And I hope that if you chose me that you would see that. And I, she told me, because I had a chance to speak with her, that she would keep her phone lines open. We can, I could ask her questions from time to time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll open this uh, up for questions. Start with Ms. Hoppy. <coughs> I just wanted to say thank you to Johai for coming and for putting his hat in the ring and for coming and presenting yourself and your um, goals to us this evening. Thank you. Mr. Urban. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you very much for throwing your hat in the ring. It's uh, quite a, a tall order to do that, and I appreciate your willingness to put yourself up for that. And I'll, I'll be fair and ask you, uh, if you are appointed, would you run? And then also ask, if you're not appointed, will you run? Well, both good questions. Um, I hadn't thought of, of running yet. I, I mean, I thought if I was to be appointed that I would, could learn the position a little bit and see what the city needed, especially the district. Um, I'm definitely new to public service, so I don't even know how to run. So it would be something to learn. Um, but if I wasn't appointed, I certainly would want to stay involved and learn more. I mean, I'm excited about what I'm hearing so far. And so, Again, I would put the idea of running out further. Um, I would put learning first. And then as far as uh, the 10 month appointment, will you show up for that time frame? And do you have the bandwidth to uh, commit to that uh, time frame? Yes, I believe I, I understand the commitment that's required, at least on Mondays. Um, I, don't, I travel a little bit for work, but typically it's later in the week if it's necessary. It's not often anymore. Um, so I could commit to be here. Um, as you need um, for the full 10 months. Okay. One more? Certainly. All right. And then uh, in your various leadership roles on boards and, and whatnot, has there been a time when uh, you've disagreed with the organization or the staff in that organization, and how was that dealt with? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm actually a firm believer in hierarchy. 
You know, but at times, even at Colorado School of Mines with my own boss, there are times when we may see things differently. Um, but again, I try to consider myself a problem solver. So if, before I'm going to go in and say, hey, this is wrong, I'm going to try and figure out a couple of solutions, a couple of different options to say, hey, did you consider this? Did you consider that? Um, you know, I'm, I'm big on the idea of being a professional and not trying to take things too personally. I'm having thick skin and, and those type of things. So I, I really can't point to one particular time. But um, yeah, there's plenty of times that we, we disagree, but we can, we can move forward. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dozman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so what attracted you to Wheat Ridge? Why did you move here? Yes, that's a great question. So I, I lived for 13 years in Edgewater, and I knew, um, I knew of Wheat Ridge. I'm, I'm kind of a, a recent married man. So when my wife and I were looking around, we, I, I was convinced we were moving to Denver. I wanted to be in Denver. I'd never been in Denver before. I grew up in the mountains, went to school in Boulder. My mom lives in the Applewood Golden area. I kind of wanted to be in Denver. The housing costs in Denver were, kept us kind of on this side of the divide. We found a great place in Wheat Ridge, and that was kind of the draw. Now, Wheat Ridge always had positive um, vibes out there. We knew about Reed Ridge, um, so there was nothing negative. It's just we hadn't looked, and when we found a place that, that that's what draw us in, drew us in. What do you consider some of the most important issues that are facing our community? Um, certainly, I, I look at housing, um, housing costs, the rising housing costs. The joke that my wife and I would say to each other is that we couldn't afford the house that we live in now, and it's only been almost five years. You know, and so things are rising. And I think we make a pretty good salary together. So what are other families doing to be able to come in to Wheat Ridge if there are opportunities? Um, so that's one. Um, and then the idea of growth. I mean, we talked about it earlier. Um, what does growth mean? I like the idea of being close to downtown Denver. I can get there easy. I can get to the airport easy. But I also like the quietness of Wheat Ridge. I like the sort of the rustic nature. How do you do that? keep that so that we can continue with the things that got us to 50 years and figure out things that are going to get us to the next 50 years. That's the end. One more. Um, so what uh, encouraged you or, or why did you decide to throw your hat in? Um, yeah, so my wife, she, she knows Monica a little bit, so sort of talked about it. Um, we didn't know what was going to happen with Monica, but we sort of assumed that if, if she did win, there may be an opportunity. So I kind of kept my eyes on it. And when I saw it, I put the application in, saw what it was sort of required. And, you know, I look at you all and I, I, I'm, I'm proud of the job you've done um, so far to keep the city that I live in up and coming and moving. And I just figured if there's an opportunity to help, I'll throw my hat in the ring. Additional questions? Jahi, thank you, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. And our next speaker is David Cuter. David. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you tonight. Um, my name is David Cuter. My wife and I have lived uh, just up the street uh, at 29th and Gray for almost 13 years now. And that location has given us direct exposure to a lot of the issues that, that regularly arise in the city. Um, our back fence is uh, the property line between our house and uh, Denver's Ashland Reservoir. And so for the past five years, um, that project has been uh, almost literally in our backyard uh, and occasionally dust dumping over into the backyard. And so that's given, uh, given me a lot of perspective as to the ways in which progress can be disruptive even when the, the, uh, the end result that, that comes out of that is ultimately a net positive for the city and uh, for the neighborhood. Um, also, we are right on 29th Avenue, which is uh, has uh, a very can have a very rural and back uh, kind of back road feel to it that that I think a lot of people value in 
Wheat Ridge, um, but it's also in desperate need of improvements to allow for safe travel uh, by all users. And I know that some of that work is is planned and coming up, but that that speaks to the need to balance improvement and development with still trying to maintain the, the, the character of the city and the neighborhoods. And finally, uh, the, the boundary with Edgewater is in the street right in front of our house. And that uh, serves as a reminder that uh, it sometimes issues and, and uh, problems don't, they don't stop at the city border. And so being aware of the ways in which uh, um, the need to work with other jurisdictions and come up with cooperative solutions to, to issues uh, and the importance of that. Um, as I stated in my application, my interest in, uh, in civic participation originally arose out of transit issues, uh, both public transit and bicycle pedestrian issues. But the more I pulled on that thread, the clearer it was that those issues are intertwined and inextricably with other issues, uh, including uh, land use issues and resource allocation, and that um, that all of these issues feed into into each other. And so, that has broadened my uh, my interest in uh, in serving the the city and contributing in ways that uh, ways that I can. Um, Professionally, I've been, I have over 20 years of experience as an attorney, primarily practicing in water law and land use, two issues which uh, go to the core of issues that, that face this or any other, uh, any other governmental body. Um, on water law, besides the, the discussion with Mr. Mamet on the importance of that inherently as an issue, it's also a fundamentally a question of resource allocation and how does a municipality ensure that it has the resources to serve its citizens both in the near term and uh, further down the line. And then land conservation is again a, fundamentally a question of what tools are available to help preserve special places around the state in the face of increasing development and growing, growing demands for uh, land and other resources. This, uh, as has been noted, this is a short appointment with uh, the, the seat up for election in, in uh, less than a year. And therefore, I think one of the, the most crucial things is that a, is a candidate that can hit the ground running and be in a position to contribute on day one and not if, if it takes an eight or 10 month growing period to grow into it, that person, whether they run again or are subject to the, to the uh, decisions of the voters may not be around to, um, to contribute by the time they get up to speed. Um, I've worked my whole career with municipal and other governmental entities and have significant experience both with the processes and the outcomes of governmental action. I've negotiated and drafted governmental agreements and have an intimate understanding of the consequences and obligations that arise from governmental commitments. I'm a member of the policy committees for the Colorado Water Congress and the Colorado Coalition of Land Trusts and uh, have personally helped push legislation through at the state capitol and so understand both the drafting and the application of laws and, and regulations. And, Ultimately, I'm ready and eager to do the homework, to show up on time, and to uh, help contribute to, uh, to this body addressing the, the issues that face Wee Ridge. Um, in, in conclusion, one, uh, I believe that the, this city is, uh, um, is, is very, is benefited by the quality of, of all of the candidates that have, uh, that have uh, come up tonight, and um, I, I'm hard pressed to see the, that the city would not benefit from any of the three candidates being selected for this position. Um, and finally, in the, the reality of, of how municipal government works was brought home to me about 15 years ago. 
Um, I was part of a small army of consultants proposing a water project to, uh, to a local city council at their regular meeting. The project had a budget in the tens of millions of dollars and was designed to meet the city's water needs for decades in the future. Um, but before we got to have our say, we had to uh, sit while well, council addressed whether the uh, municipal swimming pool temperature was being uh, kept warm enough for uh, or whether it was too cold. <laughs> and so this council will make significant uh, decisions with a wide ranging impact that it will affect the lives of the citizens for years and decades to come. But at the same time, uh, you all always need to be responsive to the needs and the concerns of the individual residents. And I believe I have the ability to balance these various perspectives and the demonstrated experience to contribute starting on uh, day one of the appointment. Um, and I guess the one other bit of perspective is that, uh, God willing, in four weeks, I will also know what it feels like to turn 50 years old. So um, I at least have that uh, shared perspective with the city. And I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, David. Uh, the water's never warm enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we'll open it for questions from council. Uh, Ms. Hobby. Again, I just wanted to say thank you very much, David, for coming and for putting in your application and putting your name in and um, for spending the time here tonight to give us your background and your um, thoughts on the city. Mr. Urban. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, David, for applying. I appreciate uh, your willingness to throw your hat in the ring. And um, I'll be fair as well and ask you if you were appointed, uh, would you run in November, and if you're not appointed, would you run in November? The, um, I'm, I'm not sure this, this city is, is necessarily served by having to go through the process of, um, of in, um, uh, bringing, a, bringing another new person up to speak come in November. And um, the, uh, while not in a position to uh, to specifically commit to running again, the um, I, I am right now. The idea is not to just sign up to dip my toes in the water. the The idea would be to uh, to hopefully become a party, a part of this body, and hopefully serve the the residents of my, of the district uh, sufficiently that that they would be interested in having me back. Um, as for the other part of the question. Um, I'm not, I'm not doing this for personal validation or out of ambition to, to have some next step. And so, um, if, uh, if whoever is appointed is doing the job that I, I have, uh, no reason to expect that they would not, um, I, I'm not sure that, that Challenging, challenging an incumbent just for the sake of seeing your name on the ballot is necessarily the, the most productive thing for the city. Um, if, uh, if somebody else were appointed and decided not to run, then I would, uh, I would at least give it some, some thought. Thank you, and um, obviously, uh, would you show up if you were appointed? Yes, that's, uh, and, and I'll do the homework. And then uh, is there a time uh, on any board or leadership role that you've had where you've had a disagreement or a point of conflict with <coughs> an organization? Um, I disagree. Certainly conflict would be a strong word, but, um, but it was, uh, um, was the Pier Street bike lanes five, six years ago? Some, something like that, yeah. And... Um, so the, the council had a, had a certain amount budgeted for that, and there was one proposal which was to do full bike lanes, and that came in, I believe, close to about double the budget. Or they could, or they said they could do Sharrows and, and kind of lesser, um, I know there's a big dispute as to whether Sharrows actually qualifies infrastructure, but a, a lesser um, project for the whole space, and, and that, 
estimate came in almost exactly what the budget was. And as part of the ADAT leadership team, I advocated that having half of the project done at the best possible, uh, at the highest level, was better than, how, than doing the whole thing at a lesser, uh, at a lesser level where eventually the facts on the ground just become acceptable and, um, and so we ended up advocating to council on behalf of the ADATs to that if, if that was the budget to just do half of it but do it right. Um, uh, Mr. Starker with his uh, great leadership uh, then managed to actually find the money to do the rest of it right. But, uh, but that's, um, so conflict or, or dispute would be a strong word, but where, um, where I think I, I successfully advocated for a, a position that, that ultimately actually helped make a difference. Thank you. Additional questions, Ms. Dozman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, do you see any conflicts of interest arising with um, your job as an attorney versus what you might see on council? Um, I do not. The um, Wheat Ridge doesn't provide the well, Wheat Ridge. The city isn't largely in the water business, and um, it, there's the ind independent district, and the water's uh, a, a, even that water is acquired from a different source. So um, I don't, I don't believe that there's any conflict uh, that way. And most of my uh, clients are. Um, are a little further out in the in the metro area, so I don't uh, I don't see that as an issue. Additional questions, David? I see none, so thank you very much. Thank you for for your presentation. Um, that um, will conclude uh, this item. Uh, we will um, these candidates will be uh, Mr. Pond. Yes. I'm sorry. Just wanted to wait for everyone to go through, and I feel really good for the city tonight um, because I we have a hard we have a really hard decision. I took a ton of notes. I know I know my colleagues did. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming out. I can't imagine. I mean, I honestly, it's an incredibly impressive. Um, three resumes, three reasons uh, or multiple reasons for, for coming out. Um, honestly, I wish we could, uh, we, we should just increase the size of the council um, and uh, get to it. Um, but gosh, you, you're, you've, uh, it's really uh, great to be in, in a position where we're gonna have such a hard decision. Um, I hope that everyone, um, you know, uh, who who um, came forward will continue their passion and, and uh, willingness to serve, and I hope that we do uh, justice to to your interest. Um, and I, I certainly intend to. Uh, I just want to thank everyone. I can't. I mean, I'm just I'm really impressed with with um, with everyone who came forward. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so I would like to thank Anne and Jahi and David for coming forward, for bringing us thoughtful, uh, thoughtful presentations, and we will uh, take this up uh, at our January 28th meeting. So thank you very much. All right, we will move to item number three on our, uh, on our agenda tonight. This is the tracks finance agreement war at the Ward TOD and Ward TOD update. And Mr. Johnstone is here to provide us a presentation. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Is this? It's on. It's on? Okay, thanks. Great. Yes, yeah, so we're here to talk about the Wheat Ridge Ward Station and uh, specifically the, the manner in which we uh, intend to spend the $12 million in voter approved uh, 2E tax revenues. Um, so, two real purposes, one a subset of the other, but uh, we want to get council uh, general concurrence on the list of, of what uh, project staff are proposing to fund uh, with the 2E funds. And then as a subset of that, uh, a separate decision point is, is really whether to use a portion of those funds to support the public infrastructure associated with a, uh, a multifamily uh, higher density project called TRAX uh, and support some of the public improvements that are associated with that project. 
Uh, to get to those two goals, this is um, my outline for what we'll talk about tonight. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I do want to go over just a brief history to refresh uh, council and the public on, on the planning and visioning that we've done for the area. Um, kind of talk about the evolution of the list of projects uh, and how it's changed since we last uh, met with council back in June of 2018. Uh, and then really, in some detail, uh, review the funding breakdown for all of the 2E associated costs, both the different projects, but then also the fact that uh, the actual construction costs are not the only thing that are funded with the 2E funds. There's, of course, uh, soft costs associated with those as well. And then just as a general matter, give you an update for what's going on in the area, some private development, uh, and some next steps that we see in the near future. Uh, this is a sub area plan that we uh, adopted originally in 2006. Uh, it was updated in 2013, uh, though not in any significant ways. It, it really is largely similar uh, to the plan that was developed in 2013. Uh, just briefly go over the substance of this. This is the station platform. Uh, this is Ward Road, the eastern boundary. Uh, this is 52nd Avenue. Uh, and this is indicated as 50th place, but that's actually now named uh, fully Ridge Road because it has been connected to Ridge Road. Station parking lot right here. Uh, the general pink area is, is fairly generally described as mixed use uh, TUD type of development. Uh, and then we indicate a kind of transition out to the uh, more auto influence on this side and then also a transition on this side uh, that would be a little bit more lower density to transition to the established uh, neighborhood, which is predominantly single family and duplexes. Uh, and then the red area is indicated as mixed use employment TOD. So employment has kind of long been a therm theme for this area. It's certainly what exists up there right now. Uh, this is a fairly heavy uh, commercial industrial employment area with a lot of good companies, a lot of good jobs, and uh, really the idea was to strengthen that. The only other thing I think I'll point out is just the fact that you can see these blue lines uh, and indicating that we wanted to get a high degree of uh, a tight network of streets to make this a very walkable neighborhood and a very multimodal modal neighborhood in proximity to the station. Um, fast forward a couple more years um, to uh, the Urban Land Institute offered to do a technical advisory panel for us. Uh, that's a, a kind of intensive one or two day workshop where they bring in uh, a number of outside real estate professionals that kind of come in and truth test um, a, a challenging real estate situation. So they brought in a great panel, Chris Koble, uh, who does a lot of TODE development, chaired that panel. And, you know, they had some good recommendations. I don't think they fundamentally uh, shifted the course. They too uh, emphasized the fact that employment could uh, be a good thing to build on uh, because it exists out there already. Uh, and also to differentiate ourselves perhaps from some traditional stationary planning where you often see uh, quite a bit of uh, higher density or moderate density uh, residen residential. Um, again, strengthening the industrial areas south of the rail. Uh, they did acknowledge that it would make sense to have some multifamily in proximity to the station. Um, and then again, transition to that lower density residential to the east. Um, they did acknowledge that the market might not support the densities that we were recommending, at least in the short term, just because the, uh, the station wasn't open and this is a more suburban context than perhaps some of the stations that you see closer to downtown or the Denver Union Station area. And a theme that's emerged quite a bit, and again, is similar to what we uh, had in our, our sub-area plan, which is you, you want to get the urban design right, right? So you want to get a tight grid of streets, good walkability to, um, regardless of the land uses, so that the area works as a, uh, from an urban design perspective. In 2016, um, we, in anticipation of uh, an event that ULI was holding, uh, in November called the TOD Marketplace, which was really an opportunity for uh, real estate professionals and communities to get together uh, and talk about TOD opportunities and really identify developers that might be interested in investing in the community. In anticipation of that, we went under contract with uh, the design firm WSP uh, and actually developed a uh, interactor, interactive virtual reality uh, video of what the station could look like and, and really what this vision plan was. So this vision plan, um, I think, tried to spell out a little more of a specific uh, vision for the area. Uh, just a few things to highlight. Uh, it did identify an opportunity here for potentially regional parks. Uh, I can give you 
an update on that as well later in the presentation. Um, but obviously these water amenities are a valued commodity in the state of Colorado, uh, and they saw an opportunity there. That was really part of a larger theme for the station area that they thought could emerge, which would, which be, would be around outdoor recreation. So both act, actual outdoor recreation and then outdoor recreation as an industry, right? So if we're going to uh, encourage jobs, there's an opportunity, and much of it already exists out there, as you probably know, to really tap into the emerging outdoor recreation industry locally, which is also a, a Jefferson County Economic Development Corporation um, priority as well as a state priority and we work closely with the state office of economic development and uh, the, uh, the the person that they have that specializes in, out, in the outdoor rec industry um, building off that they they proposed some sort of a regional park um, amenity that would extend to the station and as I think council is aware we've we've also thought about the fact that there could be a pedestrian bridge here uh, currently there's a lack of connectivity except at Tabor and all the way over to Ward, and of course Ward isn't particularly friendly for a pedestrian, uh, to create um, a pedestrian bridge uh, that's both an iconic feature that really brands our station, but also is very practical in the sense that it, it gets all these people and all these properties direct uh, pedestrian and bike access to the station. Uh, that, that linear park amenity is proposed to kind of extend up into the area, and we're actually working on creating that vision as we speak with the, the development application that's, uh, that's going forward on the Toll Brothers property, or, or by the Toll Brothers on the former Jolly Rancher site. So that's the vision plan from, uh, and one other thing, uh, you'll see that they did identify some areas for actual buildings, and you, you probably can't see it, maybe you can, but um, for co-working spaces, right? So that's a trend that uh, has been around in the Denver metro area for you know at least 10 years. Uh, we've tried to build on that uh, recommendation. We've met with uh, at least three or four of the folks that do co-working development. We haven't gotten any traction to date, but that doesn't mean we won't stop uh, looking for those opportunities as well. Uh, this really just, I think I went over most of these in that previous slide. Um, so in June of last year, as part of an overall 2E project update, we were in front of council uh, to update you on all four of the projects. Uh, this was the map that we showed you as to what we were looking at for uh, 2E types of uh, projects for the Wheat Ridge Ward station area. So you can see in red uh, the local, local street improvements. Uh, you can see in green uh, the regional park and then the linear park and then the, the yellow uh, is the pedestrian bridge. Uh, and then structured parking was also mentioned as a possibility. Uh, that's on, that, something that might happen long term on top of the existing surface lot uh, that's owned uh, by RTD for their transit riders. So the, the list of projects that we gave you back in June was, uh, and the numbers associated with those, was $8 million for local streets. Uh, we were a big range because there's a big range in de depending on the type of design that you go with of $1.5 to $4 million for that pedestrian bridge. Uh, the linear park, uh, we had estimated that up to $5 million. Uh, and the regional park similarly at up to $5 million. Um, I think everyone in the room can probably quickly do the math. That's obviously much more than $12 million, so we knew that list would have to be pared down, and those were very uh, preliminary estimates. Um, some, several things have changed, really, in that relatively short period of time since uh, June of, of last year. Um, you know, we've, we've reached out to the owners of the, of the two regional ponds. They're, there's two owners up there uh, about the opportunities for uh, either partnering in a public-private way to make those park-like amenities. Um, no partnership has, has really emerged at this point. I don't think we have willing sellers at this time. Uh, and there may be opportunities for them to develop commercially in still a way that really embraces those, uh, those pond amenities, but maybe more in more of a private fashion. But we really don't have an opportunity as we speak right now uh, and of course, we're under a, a time clock in terms of how quickly we need to spend the 2E funds. So that really is not uh, an opportunity that we have uh, presently. The tracks project that we'll talk a little bit um, uh, later uh, is the, another project that has um, come about and evolved further since uh, June. We were aware of the potential project at that time, but they've gotten a lot further along in terms of their, their financial model. Um, and uh, they've identified some, some funding gaps, which is why we want to uh, give that council consideration this evening. The Tance, uh, Hans townhome projects on the former um, Alpaca farm 
at the, the northern half of that site. Uh, they had some offsite uh, costs that have emerged, and uh, we think those are appropriate for 2E funds as well. Um, and then the pedestrian bridge and the linear park designs have evolved as well. Uh, we're under contract, as you know, with AECOM uh, to do some of the design work on the 2E projects and support us in other ways. Uh, and that was one of the, the task orders that we gave them this year. Uh, and they made good success on, or good progress on that. I think we're at about 25% design and 25% costing. Uh, and they're, they're appearing to be both feasible from a, a physical uh, civil engineering standpoint and also feasible from uh, what we believe to be uh, a financial standpoint using uh, potentially 2E funds. And then finally, the Ward Road grade separation we explored as a potential regional project. It's not on the official regional maps when it comes to Dr. Cog projects. And there really is an interest um, in adding it to those maps at this time. So it's really not a project that's going to move forward unless it shows up on some of those maps because it's a you know, 25, 30, 40 million dollar project. And so without significant regional funds, it's just not going to get done. So we don't think there's any point in setting aside 2E funds for that project uh, because it's not going to be um, financially feasible anytime soon. So um, our current proposed 2E projects and costs, I mentioned earlier that you know, a, a portion of those uh, go to professional services, uh, the design uh, development review. Uh, we have a right-of-way consultant hired now, uh, construction management uh, during construction as well. So that's estimated at $2.5 million of the 12. Uh, we estimate right-of-way right acquisition at about $725,000. Uh, construction projects themselves at about $8 million, and that totals up a little over $11 million. So, you know, we have a little fudge factor in there at this point. If, if this is a project list that Council supports uh, to um, either fund an additional project or, you know, deal with, uh, you know, costs that, might, that may exceed our current estimates. So what projects does that get us? Uh, I mentioned the Hans Ranch offsite uh, utility and drainage issues. That's a relatively small figure, but $243,000. Uh, the city's portion of 52nd Avenue, uh, we are partnering on that project with both Arvada and uh, the Jefferson County, uh, and I think we hope to actually have that in front of council at next Monday's meeting in terms of what an IGA that would uh, solidify that partnership in terms of funding. Um, if it moves forward in its current fashion, uh, we're going kind of a 40-40-20 split, so the two cities spending 40% of the project costs and the county uh, 20%. And there's, there's a rationale for that based on uh, the trip distribution and where the, where the traffic's really coming from. So our portion of 52nd Avenue would be 1.2 million. Uh, Tabor Street from Ridge Road to 52nd, we estimated $800,000. Ridge Road from the station over to Ward Road, we estimated a million dollars. Um, again, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, but the tracks project and the public infrastructure associated with that project, uh, they're requesting 1.2 million in 2E funds. Um, I mentioned the linear park and the pedestrian bridge came in, um, uh, you know, under, kind of under budget. Um, we, we're estimating that the linear park, based on kind of 25, 30% design, uh, would cost about half a million dollars or so. Um, and we, we just saw a couple weeks ago the preliminary designs for that, and it, it, looks, it looks pretty cool in my opinion. So I think that's a pretty interesting opportunity. Um, and then the pedestrian bridge, I had mentioned that that comes in between 1.5 and 4. I don't think we have an up-to-date estimate on that, but the $3 million is intended to be fairly generous to be able to get, get something that, that we can you know, be proud of and, and uh, really brand our station as well as be uh, very practical. Those, the, the bridges get expensive in part because you have to do elevators on either side um, and that becomes, and that's a real variable cost. Um, there's not, it's hard to get a really firm estimate for that at this point in the project uh, because those, those elevators are expensive but they can also be very variable in cost. Uh, moving on, just um, a quick update on what's happening out there on the private development side. I think it's important to note that the 2E ballot language, specifically to Ward Road, was very much focused on the fact that the $12 million was intended to be invested in infrastructure that facilitates and catalyzes private sector investment. And uh, we've been using the uh, kind of the, the staff, uh, at a staff level, a slogan of we want to turn 12 million into, into 50 million. 
uh, in a variety of ways, whether that being leveraging tax increment financing dollars, and most importantly, leveraging private sector investment. And the three projects that I have on this list, the Hans Ranch Remington Townhomes, uh, the Toll Brothers Project, which is a mix of townhomes, uh, live work, and some commercial space, uh, and the Tracks Project, which we'll, we'll again talk about in a moment. But uh, those three pending uh, projects are valued at, would be valued at over $150 million in terms of the amount of private sector investment. So we hope that we're living up to that mantra of that the voters approved, which was that the $12 million should catalyze private sector investment. Uh, so the tracks funding request. Um, it's the 2.2 acre site that's directly adjacent to the uh, northeast of the station. Uh, it's the southern portion of the property that was formerly the Hans property, the, gel, the alpaca farm. Um, it's going to be a market rate project, uh, about 220 units, um, highly amenitized, as they say, a project, rooftop pool, uh, you know, very, uh, very much uh, competitive with a lot of the other high-end multifamily that you see being built. Structured parking uh, is a part of that, and that allows you to achieve the higher densities. It's also really what drives some of the higher costs, right? Structured parking is, is very expensive and uh, doesn't really, you can't really make sense of those numbers. So the, the project truly does not make financial sense without some sort of public funding assistance. Uh, Renewal Wheat Bridge is considering a TIF agreement for the project. Uh, they had two meetings on that topic in December and, and started those conversations. They're scheduled tentatively for a January 15th consideration of a TIF funding agreement to um, you know, fund a portion of the project costs with tax increment finan financing over time. Uh, the overall funding gap uh, on a $54 million project is about $9.5 million currently. I think we're working to whittle that down. Uh, we've, we have a representative from uh, EPS, our financial consultant that we use on most of our public-private finance deals, with us here tonight if you have questions for him. Uh, and then $1.2 million is what they're uh, proposing in terms of 2E, 2E funding for some of the public uh, infrastructure on the project uh, through the 2E um, program. So next steps, um, you know, we're in, uh, we're, we're, we have two firms hired. Uh, SCH is three firms actually. AECOM is uh, supporting us at a, at a higher level and have been on all the other projects. Uh, SCH is the design firm uh, that is designing the three streets, so 52nd, Ridge, uh, and Tabor. Uh, they actually provided an early December uh, preliminary design, so that's moving right along. We're reviewing those uh, currently with AECOM. Uh, I mentioned the IGA uh, for 52nd Avenue that actually may expand from, in addition to 52nd Avenue, to include Ridge Road as well, or maybe through a separate IGA. I think Arvada uh, acknowledges that some of the traffic that would have gone to 52nd if that road were punched through, which it's not going to be uh, based on the direction from council, uh, will end up on Ridge Road, and that, that some of that traffic is theirs, so it could be that we're, we're looking to them for um, some sort of a partnership on the funding of those improvements as well, but we're still exploring that. Um, I mentioned the, the bridge and the linear parks. We haven't put this on the calendar yet, I don't believe, Patrick, but I think we'll be ready to get in front of council probably in the, the first quarter of this year to show you those uh, current designs that we have for those two elements. Uh, City Venture is a, is a group, Marilee Utter, if, if you know her, she's been in the, in the transit or in development kind of world uh, for many years. She, uh, she was the first person to manage the, the TOD program uh, at RTD 20-some um, years ago. Uh, she worked for uh, the Urban Land Institute in various capacities as well, and obviously they're very much focused on transit-oriented development as well. She now has her own firm and advises uh, private clients and to some extent municipalities on uh, creating TOD development deals. So she's we were under contract with her to help us uh, represent us out in the development community to attract uh, development to some of what we believe to be some of the remaining key redevelopment sites. So that's an exciting partnership as well. I think, Steve, we meet with her uh, later this week for an update. Um, again, we continue to partner with the State Office of Eco Economic uh, Development uh, and specifically their outdoor recreation industry and uh, want to continue to uh, partner with, with RTD, right? I mean, I think. We see that there you know, may be in the future uh, redevelopment opportunities, both you know, right at the station area, depending on 
how much the uh, bus bays do or don't get used. And of course, the surface parking lot could be uh, a redevelopment opportunity in the future uh, as well. And again, I think the two uh, kind of directions that we're hoping to get today uh, are, are one specifically on the, the project list that we went over, and obviously we can go back to that, uh, and then specifically whether uh, you're willing to support the $1.2 million that we're requesting be, uh, be go towards a public-private partnership with the Trax multifamily development. And that's all for me. Uh, thank you, Mr. John Stone. I'll uh, open this up for questions from council. Mr. Urban. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, what is, uh, as it relates to the traffic signal at uh, Ward Road and Ridge Road, what's the status on, on that and how does that play into this? It's a good question. Um, we had explored that. Uh, that possibility uh, several years ago when we were doing a, a grant that applied to this area with Dr. Cog. Uh, we did a, a Ridge Road design study uh, and we thought there was some justification that it might meet warrants. Um, the challenge with that is, is it's a CDOT facility, obviously Ward Road, uh, and the proximity to the, the at-grade railroad crossing gets um, CDOT engineer is pretty nervous in terms of how you could safely design that. So at this point, uh, we actually recently updated our access permit with uh, CDOT for uh, that particular in intersection. And as part of that, uh, they limited that to a non-signalized three-quarter uh, movement. So left in off of Ward Road, but no left out. And they've actually, we're working with AECOM on a design for what that intersection needs to be redesigned to and hope to get that built you know, it probably um, within the next year or so as part of the, the overall TUI project. So that's really part of the Ridge Road project. So we don't anticipate anytime soon being able to get that, them to change their mind on that, uh, which really pushes all the traffic to 52nd Avenue because the signal is, is in that location. So, uh, which is why we have the partnership with uh, Jefferson County and, and the city of Arvada. And then as it relates to the, uh, the structured parking as a part of the um, the housing uh, project, is that open to the public or is that for the residents or what's the split there? We're still work working on the details of that. Um, it, it may, it, and, and part of that is, is, a, is a matter of, you know, for it to be eligible for tax increment financing or public funding, there, has to, there needs to be some level of public access, but we haven't worked out kind of the details on that unless I don't know if you, either Steve or Patrick have any further update on that. No, we haven't, and um, we're, we're still um, working with the developer on that to see if, if yeah, there could be a certain number of spaces um, reserved for, for public use, um, and um, if, if it has to be, and I think the Urban Renewal Authority attorney said, do you remember, Steve, that that would not be required, but or if it would be required for TIF funding? It's not, it's not required. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, it's something we're still trying to get the, the developer to see if, if they can allow some um, public parking there. Okay. Oh. Mr. Matthews? What is our traffic situation going east from the station along Ridge Road? I know we've, we've got issues as far as widening of Ridge Road growing that way, and since 52nd Avenue didn't get cut through, there's going to be traffic coming, more traffic going each way on Ridge Road, which yeah. affects a lot of our, some of our communities over there. And it, then they're talked about sidewalks, and sure. you know, we're gonna put up a pedestrian bridge while we're gonna have some sidewalks going that way, and are they covered in current projects? Yes, generally speaking. Uh, one of the projects that we're proposing for two E funds would be uh, to acquire right away uh, and build a, a three lane section on the portion of Ridge Road from Tabor to our municipal boundary. Uh, which is that existing uh, residential development. The next parcel is what's known as Haskins Station in the city of Arvada, and that's going through the entitlement process as well. Uh, they'll be asking for a similar road section for the frontage for the Haskins Stations project. So two to three lane, depending on different locations, may have two, some may have three, and then sidewalks, uh, detached sidewalks on the north side of the street. Uh, there's no, there's no right-of-way available on the south side because of the 
proximity of the, of the train tracks to build a, a sidewalk on that side. Uh, the next property that you come to is, is called Quail Ridge, that's in Wheat Ridge, uh, and they build a, um, the road section already, that's a recent project that was built with a detached sidewalk. After that, there's a little pinch point uh, for two single family lots, and we haven't really tackled that um, quite yet. Uh, that would be an expensive project. Um, so we're, we're gradually getting, building out that full street section as you move to the east. Are we going to get, get into a situation where we overbuild up there? Uh, you know, we're talking about putting 200 units here and 200 units there and another couple hundred units somewhere else and then with what Arvada is doing and, and uh, the infrastructure can handle the traffic? I don't think so. Um, I mean, the, dis despite, you know, obviously several projects coming along, uh, there's actually a fairly robust tra transportation network up there. Uh, you know, some of those stations in, um, uh, or some of those developments, Arvada, you know, that traffic, a lot of that might go actually to the east, over to Kipling and Miller. Uh, you know, it's fairly easy with recent improvements that we've made to Tabor to get down to the I-70 frontage road, and that's a signalized signal out to uh, at Ward Road. Uh, obviously, Ridge Road will have right out access and right in and left in, uh, and then the signal at 52nd. And then we're trying to build that real tight grid of streets, right? So Tabor going north, Taft going north, Union going north that we're getting as part of the Toll Brothers project. So there actually is a pretty good ability to distribute the traffic. So when you start looking at what the traffic counts would be on any one of those facilities, uh, it's really uh, not even up to collector standards in terms of the volume, uh, with the exception of maybe 52nd Avenue or portions of 52nd Avenue. So, and that assumes all these developments are built. Of course, we, we have kind of the luxury of knowing what's gonna get built on pretty much all the vacant ground up there. So we think the road network will be adequate. Additional uh, questions, Mr. Pond. Can you um, explain the extents of the linear park as estimated at the, at the just over 500,000? Uh, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit concerned. I, I think that's an important amenity to the to the entire to the entire um, kind of build out and yeah. complex, and um, I'm surprised it's that low. Uh, and maybe maybe it's because the section. It's, it's, it is very linear and narrow, and maybe that's why, but I want to make sure that we are talking about the extent of that, of that, the full extent of the green line that we previously saw in, in June. Okay, so if you could just explain that a little sure. bit and maybe understand and maybe talk a little bit about contingencies or how we would handle, handle yeah. that if, in fact, it either escalated in, in unit cost or we wanted to, to capture more. Yeah, it's a good question, and, and, and we've frankly been surprised as well. Um, you know, we have AECOM working on that. Obviously, they're a, a full-service design engineering firm, um, and, uh, you know, they feel pretty good about that project at, uh, at that number. Um, and I... Th I th it's just, George, to answer your question, it would be just um, this section right. up to the... Up to the uh, Pedestrian bridge is, is the first space. Yeah, yeah. The 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 other yeah the the northern portions would in large part get built as part of that Toll Brothers project, okay. so that would be part of their private improvements. But it's it, it, we'll keep looking at that. Again, we're at about 30 30 percent design, uh, and if council is supportive of this, we'd be ready to take that to the next level of design. Uh, you know, short in short order. Um, it, it's it's a it's a it's a cool section. It uses uh, Gambion walls and it has a crusher fine uh, pedestrian facility and a concrete bike facility, uh, as well as some intervening kind of uh, gathering areas as well. So we're excited to show it to you, but we'll duly note it. About how wide is that linear cross section? It's about a thirty foot section. That's probably about all the right of way we have then. Well, we don't have right away. So one big assumption that I maybe will point out is that we assume that, that, that those property owners are giving us that property. Um, the rationale for that is that, uh, you know, it's going to be, we think, a, a great amenity for them and, and a value added in terms of getting their employees and their customers to and from the rail station, uh, as well as being just kind of a cool amenity. 
Um, so that's our rationale for, for and, and the other thing being that, you know, they currently, it's essentially built on that steep slope that separates uh, the properties, uh, the, the relatively new industrial park uh, that kind of sits a little bit in a hole uh, and then o over to Tabor. So that, that development, most of it would be on their property. You know, they have, it's kind of a liability for them right now. I mean, that's a, it's a steeply stoked wall that they have to maintain. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, there's a delta to that every year for the HOA or Property Owners Association. So those are kind of the rationales for how we'll approach them uh, in asking for them to uh, grant us a, a right away or an, or an easement. And it wouldn't require, it wouldn't take any parking or any um, infrastructure away from them currently. I just yeah. it's, just, it's just a slope that they would no longer have to maintain. And AECOM, um, also for a costing reason in part, has been working to uh, do a design that's balanced so that it uh, doesn't really require any cut or, or any fill or, or, uh, or cut, that they balance it from the existing dirt. Ms. Hoppy. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnson, that park, however, has been on the vision drawings and, and documents kind of since the beginning, right? It's kind of drawn on there so that when people are looking at <clears throat> the vision for that site um, as someone who's looking at buying that property and developing it, they've seen that that is the vision to have that park there. Yes. Yeah, yeah and, we've, and we've met with those folks. Um, you know, on a fairly active basis, um, when we were kind of evolving that vision plan in 2016, we had a series of meetings with property owners uh, to talk about the, um, and we'll be doing that again. I think those those block by block meetings are scheduled for February uh, to go over all these projects with the affected property owners. Mr. Pond, um, maybe you can go to one of the slides that had the okay. relative investments adding up to. To the 11 and and perhaps just talk a little bit about the um the what portion and maybe this isn't it sorry mm, yes when you look at these which which portion of these specifically or or not benefit the toll brothers you've talked a little bit about infrastructure to the toll brothers um uh pr property maybe Tabor, maybe Ridge, are, are these, are any of these specifically supporting that development? Oop, no, uh, I think, oops, sorry. The only one that uh, kind of uh, somewhat benefits the Toll Brothers project would be the Ridge Road improvements, but they've not asked for any uh, public monies to support any of their internal roadways. So they'll be building a, a public street network east, west, and north, south, that they'll dedicate to the city, but they're not asking for any public money for those projects. Response? Yeah, I'm sorry, and I'll just continue with a couple more if I could. Um, number of parking, structural parking spaces, and, and, and if you can just be a little bit more specific, that's either underground or first level, or uh, where, where, how many parking spaces are we solving for here? And exactly where are they in, in, the, in, the, in the system? I think Tim might. Yeah, have let's, those. let's look that up to get you a good number, Mike. Sure. I think they're parking at about one and a half per unit. Is it? Yeah. So that would be, you know, around 350. Uh, and I, th it, we're not maybe to that level of design, but I don't think it's going to be underground. I'm, I'm, I think it's likely to be a podium design. Okay. Be similar to the the project at um, the Wheat Ridge Corners project, a wrapped parking garage. So you won't see the parking, but. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. the building will wrap around. The building will wrap around it. But I think they have four or five levels of parking. Mr. Rubin, I guess uh, to speak directly to the uh, question of the tracks project receiving 2E, you know, first thing I look at is the the language of the. 2E, which says construction of street, bicycle, pedestrian, public amenities, and other infrastructure improvements to address traffic growth and facilitate redevelopment and economic development opportunities in the area surrounding Gold Line Station, including, but not limited to, construction of Ridge Road, 52nd Avenue, and Tabor Street, a traffic signal at the Ward Road, Ridge Road intersection, and a pedestrian bridge over railroad tracks linking the job center to the south, estimated share 
uh, of the total project cost, $12 million. So when I look at that, it's not saying that here's a list of the projects you could do, here's a list of projects that you will do, and then if you want to add others to that, you can. But when we're not doing some of the projects that are listed here specifically, the, and I understand the reasons behind it, specifically the construct, reconstruction of Ridge Road and the traffic signal at Ward Road and Ridge Road, those are items that we have told the taxpayers we are going to construct, but now we're not. And setting aside the tracks project itself, that there needs to be some kind of uh, consideration that uh, we're not doing what we said we would do uh, before we start uh, deciding how to spend the money. So I, I wouldn't necessarily be in favor of uh, the uh, investment in the tracks project simply because of these uh, remaining issues that for not necessarily any, any fault of any individuals, it's just the circumstances that are surrounding it. But when we're not investing in the projects that we told the taxpayers that we would invest in, that to me seems like we would be uh, in violation of the bond. So that, that, that would be my main concern. And I don't know how or if that's ever been discussed as it relates to what happens when a project that we said we we're going to build doesn't get built or, or how does that look. So. You have thoughts on that, Patrick? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the language was was flexible enough that, um, you know, we said, we said including but not limited to. Um, I don't I don't think it said that these projects will. It says including. including the word includes. And, and I was trying to pull up the language. I, I hadn't looked at it in such a long time, but I thought I thought our, our intent was to write the language that was flexible because when we put when we drafted the ballot language and put it on the ballot, we didn't we didn't know for sure if those were all the t projects that were needed to be built. And we, that's why we threw that language in at the end that, or any other projects that facilitate economic development um, projects, which um, you know we, we, we feel um, a high density um, multifamily project falls under. Um, I, you know, that's something we, we can research further with, with legal to make sure that we're, we're not violating anything in the bonds in the, in the ballot language, but I, I believe there's enough, enough flexibility there. Well, and I guess, you know, it, to uh, looking at the tracks project by itself and understanding the investment in that and the validity of that is one issue. And I'm not necessarily saying that I'm disagreeing with the with that project, but it's just that when the language says that we will include these projects and then we don't, it appears as though uh, we're not living up to the language of the of the ballot. So. That would be my main concern, and if legal says otherwise, then so be it. Mr. Uh, Matthews. I have similar concerns uh, to what Mr. Rubin was just speaking to, and I certainly could not support taking sales tax money that we alluded to being for public improvements and using them for a private parking lot for so someone can jam more property, more, uh, more people into a small space. I think we're barking up the wrong tree if we're going in that direction. Mr. Pond? Um, I, I, I agree with the, with the concern. I'm not perhaps as concerned about it in the sense that at least one or two of those items are impossible for us to build. We, they were hopeful or probable maybe in our minds when we put the ballot and language together. But if, for instance, we can't get the warrants for a light and, and we can't uh, deal with the, the crossing, we, we um, literally can't do that right now and it's not because we're choosing to trade you know money here but we, can, we can't do those projects and and I don't believe and I think it's it is important to consider and make sure that we're correct on this but I don't believe that the there was a mechanism that said that money needed to be forfeited back you know or re repaid to the you know or, or not if it is then then it, then I guess that's the way it is and that's very very unfortunate we wrote it wrong and that's a mistake because that shouldn't be that that really shouldn't be w what, what happens because obviously we can't predict within an election whether or not CDOT or a railroad or whatever is going, you know, that those things are going to be able to truly come to, to fruition. So I, I hope that we can talk more about that. And it's, I, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with the fact that it's important to talk about and to be right 
um, um, with our, with the intent and following the intent of the ballot. So I just I don't want you to think I'm arguing with that, but it just, I, I I don't I perhaps feel as you know. My hope is is that there's flexibility in the intent of how we wrote it and, and how we ought to to move forward with it, such that if you know if it's impossible for us to move some of those funds forward the way we thought, that we still have the ability to move those funds forward in some way that's going to to hit the intent the larger intent of of the of the question and I, I believe there is so that's just kind of where I'm at with that um, I don't disagree that I think it's important for us to understand the public the public value of in in a number of uh, different ways of uh, p supporting the, the project as it's being submitted to us um, and I, I don't I haven't heard it all yet, and so I'm not sure I'm all the way there yet. I think that if there's, if 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 it really is um, strictly, this is what is necessary to um, advance the redevelopment of a multifamily component within this zone, um, and otherwise it won't move forward, and otherwise this area won't, you know, won't see the the true development and the true economic development that was intended through. Then um, it's a stretch. I'm willing to listen to that, but you know, but that's, but but I think that, um, you know, that is still, you know, a stretch. I think that somehow, if if uh, uh, this, you know, assistance through these funds um, is showing specifically what the public value is, you know, um, to this area, um, in specific terms, if possible. Um, whether it's in roadway improvements and other infrastructure improvements beyond just economic development of, of, of this area, I think that would help, um, you know, look at this a, a little bit um, more clearly because I think it is, it, it could be hard to digest if, you know, if it's just, you know, um, if it's just, um, if it's just viewed as, and I'm not saying this is what it is, but if it's just viewed as, you know, you know, someone's, Parking space <laughs> uh, that perhaps wasn't even here to vote, for, you know, vote for it in the first place, and, and, and you know that we've that we've perhaps incorrectly encumbered, um, you know, the uh, the intent of the voters. So uh, I hope we can talk about that because I think that is I think that is a sensitive issue. Having said that, I do believe ultimately that that creating the creating the um, development of this area and and realizing it much the way we are showing it is very important and that you know that we've waited a long time for the uh, for the gold line to you know to to get it moving and 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 all of that but i i, I certainly think that um what we're showing these the, the number of housing units and the, and the opportunity with with the employment and and the uh, enhancements to our multimodal infrastructure are really are very important. I do believe there would be a gap if we took out this many units and and didn't try to in, try to get that in in with everything else while we are in the in the mode of, of building. So I think we should be we should think very strongly about how to do this. Ms. Hoppy. I don't, I, I agree that, you know, that we should get a little bit of more information about the language, the way it's written, and the two things in there that um, we have been told we can't do. However, I do feel like $1.2 million completely goes with facilitate redevelopment and economic development opportunities in the area surrounding the Gold Line Station. I mean, it absolutely does. And, and I understand uh, it's not sexy, it's parking. However, it also creates a place where we have uh, in-place patrons for the restaurants that'll be up there. We have uh, in-place customers and in-place employment base for everything that's gonna be growing around there. And so this is a, a, a part of the card house to create the community there. And so for that reason, I support it. Um, there's, I believe you said it was 11,000 total is what you're looking at, or sorry, 11 million total is what you're looking at with all those projects? Is Correct, just a little so over. So there's still another million dollars, plus we have, I think, like $400,000 that has to be spent um, that the citizens told us to keep to spend on 2E. So we still have, um, you know, a million dollars and then the other $400,000 if we need to then 
spend that money somehow on the traffic signal and the road reconstruction in some way, shape, or form. So I, I personally don't think that um, this needs to be a, a stop in the road. I think it needs to be, uh, let's move forward with, with moving forward with this and also look at what do we need to do with the other language in the um, ballot. Ms. Dozman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I, I definitely think that it is a relevant part of the conversation to uh, keep in mind the intent of the ballot initiative. I have already had constituents reach out to me expressing concerns about whether this money um, had, uh, we had the intent or they had the intent in, in voting for this measure, whether uh, it was supposed to go to public improvements or private investment. Um, I, for one, am generally in favor of a public-private relationship. I think that it's good for the community. I understand the $1.2 million um, catalyzing a, a more private investment and allowing us to capitalize on that money a lot, a, a lot better. Uh, but I, you know, I've kind of seen some of these projects veer away from their original intent. Um, we went through a robust public process with the Anderson Park project. Um, and then we saw several meetings um, kind of going back on and reneging on some of those um, public input processes and priorities. Um, so we invested another $500,000 into a baseball field. Um, you know, we've, we've seen issues with the Wadsworth project and kind of over overestimating <laughs> um, the project and, and, and really um, not not giving the voters what they expected, and now we're we're talking about the TOD site, and you know I've I've kind of voiced my my concerns about um, the Ward Station project as a whole, and I'm sure Arvada is very frustrated with how much um, public improvements they have um, conducted in that area, and the train is still not moving. <laughs> um, so. I also am concerned about uh, the $1.2 million from the two E-funds and then um, the TRACS project also coming back with a TIF agreement. So I think that that's kind of double dipping on government subsidies. Um, so I just want to kind of keep that in mind. So it, is, it looks like um, $6.7 million would be covered by the proposed tax increment financing. We're, we're not to a final number on that. Okay. We're still um, evaluating that, but that's approximately. Approximately, okay. All right, thank you. Mr. Johnstone, in the um, 2015 uh, ULI technical advisory panel, they noted that um, higher densities in residential construction may not be supported at this site and were really uh, thought that employment opportunities may be part of the, part of the success for this uh, TOD site. Has there been a, and, and the tracks project to me looks like sort of a higher end dense residential project has there been a real a rethinking of what uh, of, of what might successfully go there uh, yes and no I mean I think the ULI uh, report also recognized that uh, multifamily uh, residential would make sense in proximity to the station as well if I might um, if council would would be so kind as to let me go through two more slides we uh, when we went to the Urban Renewal Authority, I think they had some similar questions, Mayor, to the question that you're asking and maybe some of the other council members are asking as well, which is kind of fundamentally, how does this align with our vision, right? Mm -hmm. And we really do think it, it does, even though what we're looking at right now is kind of three residential projects that are moving forward. The Hans Townhomes, the Toll Brothers Townhomes, Live Work, and a small commercial piece, uh, and then the, the Tracks Project, if it moves forward uh, at that higher density. So, and you alluded to this as well. I mean, I think it's the, it's the first evolution of this station. I mean, the fact of the matter is we already have a lot of jobs up there, right? I mean, by far the most of any of the stations on the gold line. So we, we think these, these residential developments are really just the first step in the evolution of the neighborhood, right? We get people, uh, the, you know, the classic adage, uh, retail follows rooftops, right? I mean, it's a real thing. So 
the people that were getting up here between the developments right at the station, the Haskin Station project, a couple of projects that are moving forward in, uh, in Wheat Ridge further to the west, really are, are what are going to start to drive the retail opportunities. Um, another thing, and then we get the placemaking, right? We'd start to create the place, we build the streets, we get the people, you get the activity that, that makes it an attractive area for a job creator as well, right? I mean, to see that this is actually a place where they could, right, right now it doesn't feel much like a place, it feels like a very industrial area. Um, and then when we start looking at what the future redevelopment opportunities are, they're not residential, right? There's not another piece of dirt up there that's zoned residentially. Everything else is owned commercial, mostly industrial employment. So as you start looking at some of the strategic vacant pieces of purple, about parcels that might develop over the next five to 10 years, um, the regional pond parcels, I mean, those are pretty amazing commercial parcels that when you create this neighborhood, when you build the linear park, uh, and, and you have the I-70 visibility and access, those are great commercial parcels. Uh, you have the park and ride parcel that RTD will be vacating further to the south on Ward Road. That's a little further away, but still in terms of creating kind of the, uh, that, would, that would be a great site to create jobs on. Um, several underutilized industrial storage parcels that are very close to the station that over time, you know, one would presume them that market forces will, will dictate those into the different uses. We've been very clear with those property owners. We're not pushing anyone out, but, you know, my sense would be that the market would drive those into job creating uh, parcels in the future. You have a lumber yard. Um, you have a completely vacant parcel on War Road. So those really seem to be, well, well I, I kind of get the concern that, okay, now all we're getting is residential. And, and believe me, this guy behind me, Steve Art, uh, sends that message too. Uh, but we really think that there are opportunities down the road to both get this initial phase that really starts to create the neighborhood, and then down the road look at all these other opportunities to also create commercial spaces, retail spaces, and job creating spaces. Thank you. Thanks for indulging me. Additional questions? Mr. Matthews? Yeah, if I could just read a little bit here that I believe is from the original language uh, from the ballot issue. Wheat Ridge Ward Commuter Rail Station Area. Construction of street, bicycle pedestrian, public amenities, and other infrastructure improvements to address traffic growth and facilitate, not build, but facilitate redevelopment and economic development opportunities in the area surrounding the goal line. The whole thing that we sold there was we we're going to improve the public part of that so that the private investment had a place to build on. And I cannot believe I could ever condone spending 2E money on somebody's private parking lot. And, and let me be clear, I think maybe I communicated this incorrectly, but the 2E funding would not be funding the parking lot, right? The, the, really the gap in the project pro forma to a large extent is, is driven by the fact that it has structured parking, which just the market doesn't support in this location in Wheat Ridge. But the 2E funds, the $1.2 million in 2E funds would support other public improvements that this project needs. So improvements to 51st Avenue, uh, improvements to Tabor Street adjacent to the project, and improvements to a, a stormwater detention pond for the project. So they would be public infrastructure that supports the development of this property. But don't it, we already it, have those numbers in the other Tabor Street and what other no, categories? No. So what are we improving then on, on Tabor and Taft? It'd be the rest of, of Tabor and Taft that aren't adjacent to this property. I still have to see it. I have to see what? Where where the money's going and and On for the other and for what you know where the actual expenditures are going to be placed in. Uh, I mean, if they're going to if they're going to use up so much of their space with their structured parking, that that they need more money to do something fancy for storm drainage. That's on them, not on our taxpayers. Understand what I'm saying? They can they can scale down the size of their project without and and perhaps not have that funding gap. And you, the one point two. No, million. and it's a good point, uh, Mr. Matthews. And they, they could. Um, the other option they could do on this side is is townhomes. Um, but is that is that what you want adjacent to a, a commuter rail station? And maybe maybe that's fine for you. Um, 
but you know I think TODs developments encourage higher density more people and the only way to get um, uh, this much density on that parcel is structured parking um, otherwise you'd have to sur surface park everything and there's no land for that well and I'm just not sure that that's still going to put a huge impact on our surface streets because I'll guarantee you that those people aren't all going to be jumping over to the three car train and going to, going to work so so that may be a good thing if the density is not so high as far as I'm concerned that they that they have to build it without structured parking Mr. Pond yeah I, I just want to say that that was kind of the clarification I was looking for earlier which is that you know the clarity that, that you know that, that that you're just identifying one reason for the gap the funds actually are going to improvements on the adjacent right-of-ways and streets that would have that they are in, they have to do as part of our uh, uh, development and that's what this these funds would go to so that's I think that answers my question previously of of the, the kind of perception and or actual intent of how how um, the funds would would be used so thank you for that clarification mr. urban I guess to what mr. Pond just said it, are the improvements in the tracks project only in the streets on the right-of-way or is it on the private property that those improvements are being made because I think there's a distinction there between improvements uh, public improvements on the private property versus public improvements in the right-of-way or, or the street um, Tim I don't know if you how in the weeds you are on, the, on that I mean it's, it's my understanding that all that 1.2 million goes towards public improvements that have been identified, but I'm not sure we're at the point in the project that we know exactly what it's going to fund because, again, they don't, this project doesn't make sense for them unless they get public assistance. I mean, that's the reality, right? So they're not all the way to the finish line in terms of what every last dollar and cent is on the project. But Tim, can you add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I'm not 100% in the weeds on specific improvements that they're going to make, but I mean, in terms of eligible improvements, I think they've identified close to $11.5 million in eligible improvements. A big chunk of that, roughly $6 million, is the parking structure, but that leaves close to $5 million in uh, utility, site work, uh, soils testing, demolition, things like that, that do represent uh, some other kind of public benefit and are kind of more site-wide cost. And, and when Tim says, Eligible that that means TIF eligible. Right. So there's a right. there's a distinction between what's what's TIF eligible uh, and what's eligible in our minds to meet the spirit of intent of the two E uh, voter approval. And I, that was that's what I was going to say is that there's a distinction there between urban renewal and the two E. And in my mind, I I'm concerned about this project and these funds, but I'm also concerned about the next time we as a city go to the voters and ask for any kind of uh, financing or tax increase or y you name it, I want to make sure that what we're doing here is as straight and as narrow as possible so that uh, when we come back again at some point because of Tabor and everything else, we're eventually going to be coming back to the voters. I want to make sure that they have the confidence that we are able to do exactly what we said we would do. And that's why I, I brought up the issue with that other project that was up by the gold line, gold line area that Mark Westbrook brought up, and that's why I'm sort of towing that line to make sure that whatever we spend of this 2E money, we can defend to any voter that we go back and ask for anything else down the road that we did this right and that it was uh, in line with what they asked, uh, that they asked us to do. So that's my concern. Mr. Johnson, is it pretty typical for a, for a residential development project like this, going to cost fit about $54 million? And they're running after they've put their private equity in, and after they've gone to the bank to borrow the money, they're still 20% short on the funds. I mean, that's, and I'm not a mathematician, but is that how the math sh shakes out? Maybe a question for Tim. He works on. Oh, go ahead. or Tim, go ahead. For quite a few of the the projects that we've worked on in the past that are in a renewal area and require a public subsidy that subsidy typically ranges from 10 to 20 percent of cost generally more on the higher side of that range so, so it's, it so, is not untypical yeah. for a project um, receiving 
uh, TIF revenues or some other form of public subsidy to get and, between. And them. so just on a simple business analysis, how do you turn around and say, what's the return to the citizens for that investment? Where does, where does, it, where does the return come? Well, um, I, I think it depends on how you want to look at it. I think there's different ways that, and people are going to agree and disagree on it. I think what you want to want to look at, but you know, there's, there's a 50, it's a $54 million private investment in our community. It's providing a new, new housing, um, option. Um, it's providing a, a, a dense, which not everybody's going to agree with, um, higher density at a commuter rail station, which the whole state is, is investing billions of dollars into a commuter rail station. And I think as a city, we have some responsibility to, um, to, to build dense projects around that to deal, to help deal with our traffic issues, right? Um, you know, those are some of the, some of the things. Um, can and Tim, do you have any others? And, and council may have their own, own thoughts to that. Background. I mean, you know, and part of it, and I'm a, you know, as sort of a business guy and doing little developments, you know, who are my partners in this? Who are, who are the guys that are bringing this to us? I mean, have, you know, we don't really know much about them. I mean, they're, they're coming to, ask us for a, you know, a tax subsidy from the citizens, um, you know, so will they be able to make the, make the deal happen? I mean, I think we believe they will with public subsidy. I think without public subsidy, this deal doesn't pencil, and they'll probably go ahead and build townhomes. I think in terms of, you know, why, does, why is the subsidy needed for this project? Um, I mean, they're building basically a project that would pencil in Denver um, because you get 20% more rent, right? Um, and this market is just not that mature to build this product um, at this time and be able to get the rent that covers the construction costs, right? Uh, I mean, the, the, the land might have been uh, certainly cheaper than land you'd buy in Denver, uh, but the construction costs aren't, right? Right. They're the same. So it just fundamentally you can't make a project like this with structured parking, highly amenitized, et cetera, um, makes sense in the Wheat Ridge market where rents are, you know, a, a dollar per square foot less than they would be in certain parts of Denver, if not more. Thank you. Mr. Matthews? I just, I just found that the use of the language there interesting. You said, well, it would require public assistance. Well, by whose standard? And as Mr. Johnstone just mentioned, this may not be the right project for Wheat Ridge at this time. If we're trying to build a Denver project in Wheat Ridge, well, then maybe we need to sit back and take a deep breath. I mean, required by whose standards? That's an issue. Um, I don't think any project just automatically gets to say, well, we require X dollars of tax dollars in order to build this project on, your pro on our property. Well, it's, it's required. I don't care what the re it's, it's, give me an ROI on that. I, yeah, well, I mean, that's is. one thing that's going to have that's to happen for certain. And that's what that's what's that's and what determines. It's got to required. include more than just the dollars and cents for that project. It's got to be the character of the neighborhood, what it does to the surrounding neighbors. We're already who are already who are already concerned that we're going to jam up their streets so that they can't get down their streets that they used to get but down a year ago. And I'm really, really against that kind of density where you have to put in a four-story parking structure. I mean, uh, it just, to me, it doesn't make sense for what we sell ourselves as for Wheat Ridge, even if it is at the end of the line for the light rail, which, by the way, the last time I saw the line that went out to Golden, when they got it built, it had about half the ridership they projected. So there's a lot of things here that go on that's kind of pie in the sky that I'm not really happy with on that particular calculation. Ms. Hobby? Again, I feel like it's, that's why it is so important for us to support a project like this because it does create the community. It will create the ridership on the line. It will create the place for the employers, employees to live close. I mean, it's, it's part of your, you're building a community from scratch what's going to make this community the absolute most successful. And um, I actually uh, had gone to a, <clears throat> a conference that the, uh, the ULI did, and it was a, a project where <clears throat> we used Legos, and we had poor formas, and we had to build our city block. They gave us, you know, 16 blocks, completely leveled it, 
said, here's a few parameters, build what you can in there. And I, I think that that exercise was a, a really good educational exercise for me to see how these kinds of things, when you're starting from scratch, what, what do you need to do to create that community so that it has long-term success? Townhouses, to me, don't say long-term success. Uh, high, the high-rise with the, with the high amenities and um, the ability to ride your bicycle to both uh, Wheat Ridge and Arvada and um, also to be close to the mountains and to be able to, if you're going to work downtown, downtown, or if you're going to work in this new thing that uh, the city of Westminster is getting ready to just blow up on one of their sites, which is going to be really amazing and huge. And so you can connect and then get back up to there. E either way, that we have to create a space that has long-term down-the-road vision, not what we think we should be doing right this minute on this. We have to look further. And so that's why I think $1.2 million to support this. For me, I support this. $500,000 that we spent on a baseball field that will very likely not be multi-use field very often was a waste of money. So I think that we should be spending our money on something like this. Ms. Dozeman? So I just, I want to say that I support density in this area, um, specifically adjacent to this project itself. Um, the fact of the matter is we're um, a metro area town or city and so we're either going to see density in our undeveloped land or we're going to see an infill of density in our neighborhoods which we have seen and heard from many of our constituents that they don't want so if we're going to be providing our community density it makes more sense to be allowing these kinds of projects to move forward um, clear creek crossing the tod site where we do see denser projects and then protecting and maintaining our neighborhoods as they are and as we have come to know them and love them. And so I'm, I'm not disputing the project itself. Um, I'm just, I want a little bit more information as to the tax increment financing, what that would look like, and also the $1.2 million. And I agree and reiterate some of those thoughts of, I want the voters to have confidence in us when we come to them with ballot initiatives for a tax increase that they know and understand and respect the kind of projects that they're going towards and th that they continue to have that trust with us. Mr. Pond? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, just to kind of go around the room and somewhat form a consensus, I want to kind of, to kind of come in right there and say that I, I support this. I, as I said right from the get-go, I think we need to be right, we, you know, we need to be able to defend our use um, and the language of, of, of the ballot. We should, we should follow up on that. Um, and, um, but I actually like, you know, what council member Dozman just said about, you know, this is the right place to be dense. Um, and, and actually I think it's, it's the right, it's the right way of saying, saying it in the terms of the, some of the things that have come forward to, to us. Um, you know, if we, if we, if, you know, if we can do the right density here, then we can, I think have, uh, we, ha we have a better chance of protecting the infrastructure, transportation, and housing, and and other land use that that we've been facing um, elsewhere. So, um, just want to thank you for saying that, Mr. Matthews. Just one note, and then is somewhat argumentative, and I apologize for that. But I don't think, as a city, our responsibility is to fill RTD's trains. RTD has a responsibility to serve our needs and not for us to adjust if they overbuild or whatever. Um, it just shouldn't work that way. Ms. Hoppy. So, well, I'm just wondering, like, um, I don't, I kind of what I'm feeling is that it sounds like a, a, everybody needs to at least understand that the language of our ballot is, has got us covered. Um, and so I feel like that's something that uh, we would like to see come back. So maybe I'll try for a consensus with that piece first. Like we'd like to consent that we would like to hear from our lawyer that we're in a good place with the language and the spending the money and what is the consequences and whatnot. Are we? We have consensus yeah. on that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try for um, to 
also make a consensus, keeping in mind that this again is only 11 million of the 12 million. This 1.2 is included in the list, which is not up there anymore that I keep pointing at. Um, <laughs> the list um, of several projects and that we still have um, some additional funds and an additional $1 million should we then need to have to go back because of legalities, because of language, to go back and do some other things with the, some of the stuff in the ballot language. So I would um, like to um, support the participation in public-private um, development and agreement of $1.2 million for a tracks multifamily project at the uh, Ward Road uh, TOD site. And I'd like to ask for consensus for that. Four. Well, that's a majority. Great, thank you. Okay, does that uh, does that give you the direction that you're well, going for? I think yes, thank you. Uh, but also perhaps uh, consensus on the rest of the project list as well. I don't think. Do you want to pull that up again? Is it up there? Yep. I'd like to ask for a consensus to spend the current proposed two E project costs for Hans Ranch, 52nd Tabor Ridge Tracks, the Linear Park and the Pedestrian Bridge with a total of $11 million. And there is a majority Thank you. opinion for that. Does that, uh, Thank you. Does that give you the direction you're looking for? Yes, thank you. Okay, then we will conclude um, item number three and move to staff reports. Mr. Koff. Yeah, um, just real quickly, I'd like to introduce um, somebody in the audience. I think she's, she's listening. Um, our new administrative services director, um, Ali Sheck, is right back here. Um, she started last uh, Wednesday, I guess. Yeah, so um, welcome to Allison. She's bringing a um, great amount of experience from the city of Lakewood and, and other um, employment, um, uh, focusing on uh, process improvements and community outreach and team building, so we're very happy to have her on board. Yeah, great, welcome. Um, Mr. Tulio asked me to, to let everybody remind everybody that uh, today at midnight is, is he's officially done for the city of Wheat Ridge, um, and he has graciously offered to um, come back and, and provide any uh, mentoring and education for the uh, treasurer that you appoint um, in the future to help them get up to speed and he's left everything in great hands and, and um, left everything in good condition with our investments. So um, I think we're set until we have a new person in that, in that role. So thanks. Thank you. And that application is out in the public domain and it is, and we're scheduled for February 4th um, candidate presentations um, for that role. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, We'll move to elected officials reports. Ms. Hoppy. Um, I just want to give everybody a little bit of a heads up that on our tentative um, schedule for January 28th, which is a regular um, business meeting, we'll be adding a special study session to the end of that uh, discussion on procedures for appointments to boards and commissions and finalize amendments to the council rules and procedures. Um, I know that we try to, we don't really like to do study sessions after business meetings, but with the December, January, February holidays, we end up with a real long list, and so we could we felt like we could fit those in there pretty easily on the 28th. Any other uh, elected officials reports? Well, I would wish everyone a happy new year. I hope they had a nice holiday, and with that, we will adjourn our meeting. Thank you. <laughs>